I'm quite happy having this presentation after to silicon suppliers, after to silicon manufacturers. And I think some of the audience might have seen that there's, um, I think we're not there yet. Um, so looking at um, the presentations we had actually um, this morning, that there's still some different understanding of how the design of cold band glass, um, referring to the structural silicon, shall be done. It's a bit of also the experience that I have that um, if you're speaking to the silicon suppliers, sometimes um, you hear a stress-driven design, a strain-driven design that we've seen actually um, like from Dow. Then also the whole discussion about overlaying long and short-term stresses, tensile and shear, completely different understanding right now. Um, I mean, I'm chairing this complex curved session now, um, I think now for the second or third time. And um, so even after six years of evolution, I think we are still not there yet. Um, so I really hope that even with today's um, day, we can shed some more light into the whole topic. How can we design the structural silicon for cold band glazing? Um, I would like to start my presentation, maybe just going to go through this slide very quickly. I'm working, I'm actually for Rumble, um, quite a big company, about 15,000 people worldwide. Um, and I would like to start this presentation with a job that's not curved, not cold band, it's just simple flat glass, even very tiny little pieces of glass. So this thing should be completely out of date, because nowadays everybody's going for big glass, mega glass, jumbo glass, curved. And, um, but I want to raise some questions, actually, to our industry. Now, this thing lasted for more than 100 years. Still people go there and say, this is beautiful. Still nowadays, after more than 100 years, this thing is still here. Um, it's actually still there. Just got um, a couple of years ago um, actually refurbished. And um, I'm just asking, um, what are we doing nowadays? Will it also last 100 plus years? Well, still after 100 years, this building will be fully functional. Um, and will still people say that this is beautiful. So um, maybe learning from the past and um, also maybe sometimes the beauty is not in the big sizes of glass, maybe sometimes not in the curved glass, maybe the beauty is sometimes in the design. So just a bit of question marks that I want to raise and maybe um, during this kind of talk. Now, talk about cold bending. Um, and I personally I realized quite a few um, cold band projects um, over the last couple of years. Um, and I would like to um, show you the two different types. The, so actually the two presentations that we had this morning was mainly about the so-called single corner cold banding. So the single corner cold banding, which is shown on the left hand side over here, so the principle is quite simple. So we're taking a flat piece of glass, three points define a coplanar surface. Point number four is then warped in or out. Relatively straightforward, done on quite a few jobs now worldwide. And um, the kind of bit of newer technology, which is shown on the right hand side, the so called freeform shape called bending. Now, for the single corner coat bending, usually your aluminum framing is everything is flat, everything is coplanar. Um, the mullions and transons are actually linear extrusions. Um, on the right hand side, for the freeform shape coat bending, um, we actually pre bend the aluminum extrusions. So the mullions and transons are curved sections, permanently curved. We then put a flat piece of glass on top and then coat bend the glass in a kind of freeform shape, which adds a lot of more complexity. Um, while for the single corner coat bending, there are a lot of um, kind of manual kind of hand calculations being done right now. So people assess the stress distribution around the corner. Um, so for the single corner code bending, there are quite a new design guidelines nowadays. But if you step into the freeform code bending, you're starting with a complete white sheet of paper. There's nothing there yet. And you also have to step into the whole thing of about finite element analysis that I presented about two years ago. Um, I want to talk about um, the kind of main principles because we're not only code bending the glass, we're also code bending the aluminum framing. And um, then the structural silicon, um, if, it's, if it's a structural silicon glass system between the aluminum and the glass, it's usually tend to be the weak point. So this kind of shows a kind of principle. It's actually starting from a flat unitized facade panels, aluminum framing and glazing, with then single corner code band or actually start to actually free from code band. All of these technologies have different pro and cons, and also if you look into the structural silicon design at the bottom end of this kind of graph, um, the complexity levels increase significantly going from single corner code bending to the freeform shape code bending. Now with the freeform shape code bending getting into all nasty things, I would say, no really things that are really you don't want to handle with. Um, but there have been like uh, projects out there, uh, one project where the free from code bending has been done, where actually Rumble Facade was involved at very early stages during the design. I was personally involved at a very late, late stage. And it was also kind of a learning curve because sometimes things initially don't go well, so you're learning things. 
Um, I want to start this presentation with a um, single corner code band project, which is the Shining Towers in Abu Dhabi. Um, and again, so the client came to us and was asking, I have this kind of idea, the actor wanted this fancy curved building, like two people dancing and leaning against each other, so it's a completely curved facade. So in the bottom left hand side, we can see all of the floor slabs or the slab edges twisting over the height. Um, now this kind of project was actually realized with a local facade contractor, so nothing very special, it's nobody coming in from Europe or the United States, a local Middle East facade contractor, even not extremely qualified. Um, and this is a kind of goal, what we want to do nowadays, that we're bringing this new technology into the mass market, that we're realizing this kind of project at almost no cost plus compared to a flat facade. Now this facade over here, it was realized maybe with about 5 to 10% cost increase compared to a kind of flat facade, because the technology is so far evolved that we take a lot of technologies and just take it step by step and then realize these things. Um, now the kind of shining towers you can see on the left hand side, all the structural models, the ETAPS models, the concrete framing, see how the tower leans and inclines at kind of two towers. Um, it was um, designed as a kind of pair of kind of dancing towers, so two people dancing, leaning and so-called um, twisting and so on. Um, so step as you can see here during actually the construction, how the facade actually twisting over the height. Now the main principle, and I think this is what we need to understand, we need to understand what we're doing, what we're doing to the glass, what we're doing to the aluminium framing, and I hope that this video file is going to work, yeah. So it's a fully unitized facade system, and then the single corner cold bending starts, we're pushing this corner in. Next unitized panel comes, and this is actually then pushed inwards. Um, so step-by-step -step process. Um, I would like to follow up actually um, on Sika's um, talk and um, I mean I call it the factory pre-code bending. Now with a single corner code bending, one of the big issues is actually the shear stresses in the structural silicon because um, the glass has to follow the aluminum frame in terms of curvature. So on some of the jobs, also on other jobs that I've been um, like involved, we started to actually factory pre-code bend the panels. Which Actually, which means we are pre-bending the units in the glass kind of workshop in the factory. We then put the structural silicon in there and then let it cure. Now going, uh, going actually, actually to, the, to the next slide, how is it done if we factory pre-coat bend our unitized facade panel? Um, so again, hopefully the video works. Um, yes, yeah. So put in the structural silicon first, which is the kind of traditional approach. Yeah? You fully fabricate your unitized facade panel. Then you start to, oh, to coat bend. Let me go back and hopefully this is going to start. Yeah. So putting the structural silicon first. Um, and then we um, single corner code bend the whole unit. Um, this technology is a kind of traditional way. However, we get relatively high shear stresses in the silicon. Also, um, Uli Müller was covering the kind of topic, how we can get around this kind of high, high shear stresses actually in the structural silicon. Um, now, this is why this kind of factory pre-code bending was developed, which we're going to show you later on. Now, for the Shining Towers in Abu Dhabi, traditional um, like approach, this was done already a couple of years ago. There was extensive testing being done and kind of mock-up testing, so we code banded the glass up to high degrees. See how the glass actually reflects over here. Um, so during the mock-up testing, we code bend up to the um, ultimate. So we just try to figure out how far can we go and what are the kind of critical points. And looking at the kind of facade engineering, it's, um, it's first of all, of course, the structural silicon, but also the aluminum framing. So we can see here how far the male female unitized systems actually spread and open. So is the facade still performing in terms of water tightness, air tightness, and so on? Um, so it was a quite a nice learning curve. See, actually doing it step by step. So we start to continue code banding, what's happening with the glass. So we had actually um, deflection measurements. We checked actually. Um, deflection of the glass, center of glass, aluminum framing, and so on. Because um, in the end, we need to be sure that what we're doing is going to last, going to survive the warranty. We also need to more or less guide quite often the facade contractor that this is actually doable. Um, and again, um, some more testing over here, step by step, up to about 300 and 400 millimeter of code bending and seeing what actually happens. We set up a whole process of the, of the kind of verification step by step. And as I mentioned before, quite often the consultant um, Especially when this was built, we couldn't fully rely on the silicon suppliers because the technology, the whole research wasn't there yet. So it was a kind of learning curve kind of exercise. We also double checked actually the finite element models. Um, so are our prediction, are our um, analytical models, are they correct? Are they 
then matching the kind of test results, and you can see the kind of stress peaks that we actually expected in the middle of the glass over here. This is exactly where the code band unit then cracked during the testing. So we're quite happy that we can actually validate our finite element models against the actual testing on the mock-up. Um, there are also quite a lot of questions coming from the contractor. Um, when we code band this unit test facade panel, um, we need to overcome certain resistance, so we're doing elastically bending. How much force do we need? So is it sufficient just pushing by hand or pulling by hand? Do we need to have a jack hydraulic test? So um, we did the testing, we're checking all of the loading, what the kind of load do we need on two panels, and they vary to quite a certain extent. Um, so quite amazing seeing that, that the two panels were not actually the same. Um, so still some small question mark where it's coming from. Um, but usually as a consultant, you're a bit more hands-on, so you need to get things built. So we didn't have the time to do a full laboratory test. So for us, this kind of testing was sufficient to actually make us confident that what we're doing is actually working. Um, some kind of deflection measurements of the cold bending, certain um, gauges over here. So we had um, LVDTs um, installed on the Marlins and Transom, checking what happened happens. And it was more or less linear, so more or less what we expect is kind of linear behavior, nothing non-linear, nothing going completely mad. So we're quite happy how it works. Um, and again, some more on the, um, like on the Spandrel panel unit. Um, and some are testing over here on the top transom then, and the results were quite, were quite positive. They said, okay, we think it works, and let's go ahead. Um, one bit of issue is that a lot of people don't really consider, because when we code band, everybody's currently speaking about the structural silicon, but we also need to speak about the aluminum framing. And um, what about our kind of gasket system over here? You can see that when we maximum code band, this thing is opening quite a lot. And we do see that our kind of male female, the gasket and system is still working, meaning that this whole thing is still airtight, watertight, and so on. Because we're not only designing for the structural silicon, so it is actually designed for the entire system. Um, however, when you, when you do kind of normal code bending, and I mean, I personally realized projects worldwide where we code bend insulating glass units up to maybe 140 millimeter code bending of the IGUs, and um, kind of single glazing, single laminated, um, about to maybe 280 millimeter code bending, social silicon glazed, so quite a lot. Um, so usually when you do these kind of amounts, then this angle isn't too bad. So um, yes, you need to consider it, but usually it's not a kind of critical point. Um, now again, the code bending, what do we do? The whole aluminum frame is actually twisting. Another question is, what about the kind of malleum to transom connectors, all of the kind of screws going, to this, um, going here into the screw channels? Are they overstressed? What's happening with these? So quite a few questions that we went through to see, um, is it actually safe? Is it working? Um, now coming back now to the structural silicon design, and um, this is kind of um, theory, and this is kind of what we're actually looking at. And always I want to, that we should remember, we should consider that two times, we have two times structural silicon, we have the primary seal and we have the secondary seal. So we have structural silicon between the glass and the aluminum framing, but we also have structural silicon between the inner and the outer pan of the IGU. And when we're talking about the whole factory pre-code banding, then yes, we can factory pre-code band this structural silicon over here, which means we code band first in the factory, then put the structural silicon in here. But what about the glass? Yeah? And this is the thing that we currently started looking into as rumble facade. Can we factory pre-code band also the IGUs? So during the glass processing, we pre-code band them and then put the IGU edge seal in there because this is the only way to avoid high shear stresses. Um, but this would start a whole new discussion. So we started discussing actually with glass processors and said, whoa, we never did this before. So we need to code band the glass during and then put the silicon and ooh, we never did. Um, but maybe yes, someone need to start with it. Um, and um, to overcome the stresses or the shear stresses in the silicon, someone has to be brave enough and do it. Um, and I think, why not? Um, I want to show you this slide, um, what we're talking about. And this is actually kind of one-to-one -one kind of um, CAT modeling. What is the kind of shear stresses? How do we kind of, what we're doing to the structural silicon? And you see it's both the primary and the secondary seal that actually start shearing. Um, and as I said before, this one we can handle also that actually um, Uli mentioned, this kind of pre-code banning, factory pre-code banning. But this one over here, whoops, question mark, yeah? We need to be more smart. Um, now again, we said um, these were just measurements on the um, elongation, on the kind of deflection of the structural silicon, which, is, uh, which wasn't giving us too many answers. So I would maybe just want to um, go to the next slide quickly again. Um, the secondary seal, a bit more, quite a more or less linear, so not too much that we could measure. Um, 
Now, talking about again about this kind of um, comparison, um, there are a lot of jobs being done doing this so-called single corner code bending, and I think we all have a more or less good understanding on what we're doing. Um, maybe the silicon suppliers, we should get a bit more together, because if I'm speaking to silicon suppliers, they tend to have completely different approaches. Um, I don't want to men mention any names, but I think um, the industry is not there yet. Um, so maybe step by step, and maybe at one point of time, we need to bring all of that into our design standards, into the e-tech and so on. Um, and maybe this is um, maybe the next goal, because um, a lot of people do code bending, and everybody's doing the structural silicon design in a kind of way that they think is right. It's some testing, as I did, some testing, some other jobs, a bit of understanding. Um, but if you want to bring this into, um, into the mass market, I think we need to have some more research being done, more, pub more kind of publications, and all of us should be kind of in line of how we do it. Um, I want to move on from the single corner code bending um, to the freeform code bending. And I presented a project about um, two years ago, which was one of the, or is one of the first um, freeform shaped code band facade, which is then shown on the next slide. Um, just a quick one um, on, the, um, on the finite element design. And again, I'm looking at the presentation like from DAO, um, it was strain driven design, so we're looking at the strains, not the stresses. Um, and again, how we do it, um, I've personally found out we're getting a lot of these stress peaks around the corners, um, they walk it up to the sky, these extremely high stress peaks at the corners. Um, how do we handle these? Can we just ignore them? Can we allow some elongations? So still some question marks are left. Um, now let's go to the freeform code bending. And I presented this project already two years ago. Um, actually, Rumble Facade was doing the initial design of this project. Um, I think one of the um, ladies over here knows this job quite well. Um, I want to take this job because it's quite nice, because this is the first um, freeform shaped code band structural silicon glazed facade with all the tricks and issues and so on that this project already had. Unfortunately, the facade contractor went bankrupt on this job and also some other trouble we are facing by this job. I was not involved during the late stages, only during the structural silicon verification. But still for us as a kind of industry, um, it's good to see these things. Um, someone has been brave, someone actually built it. Um, looking at the kind of design over here, um, what's actually built, um, it's quite close. Um, now during the early stages, they were by Rumble doing some sketches, some mock-up, I think this was in Italy done, um, on the code bending, this, I think this was single corner code bending. Um, but looking at the theory, I want to look at the kind of basics behind the kind of theoretical things behind. And this video explains it quite, quite nicely. So we have a pre-curved aluminum framing, the flat piece of glass comes on, and you then you push it down. Yeah? Um, let's try it again. Glass is flat, and then the corners are pushed down. You're doing this either concave or convex, both are actually doable, and you're pushing the glass down. It looks a bit scary, and it's, it is scary. If you don't know what we're doing exactly, um, it looks a bit scary because it's, it's, it's quite a brutal force pushing the glass down. Um, so this was um, convex, now going into concave, and hopefully the video starts here. As I said before, aluminum frame is actually pre-curved or pre-bent, then the glass is pushed down. And then for the um, factory pre-coat bending, you then apply the structural silicon afterwards, so now, which means you're avoiding all of the shear stress in the silicon if you do apply the structural silicon after this process over here. Um, how was it done in the workshop? Um, unfortunately, this facade contract is no longer on the market, um, also because of this project. Uh, but you can see that the small gap over here, between here and here, and then this glass is actually pushed down. Um, and the people start to do it going round and round. So this guy first and this guy. Um, there's a kind of Norton tape you look actually by, by your kind of eye when you get in contact. Um, and then after the entire process, then the structural silicon was actually put in. So it's, um, I call it um, factory um, pre coat bending. Um, you can do a similar thing um, actually, um, actually with a single corner coat bending. I did a big project um, actually um, in Beirut doing the factory pre coat bending. So pre coat bend first, and then you have certain transportation frames. So you bring then the units pre coat bend in a kind of frame on site. Um, now going to the next slide, I think it's another video. Apologies for poor quality. But then you look, what's the gap? Push it further down. And then you go around, because it is free from. Yeah? So you need to check all of the area along there, along there, and push the glass further down until it's everywhere in contact with the kind of um, Norton bar. And then um, 
the structural silicon was put in FE afterwards. Um, it's a bit of a time-consuming process. Um, and um, yeah, this is how it was done. I want to raise another question. We're now looking at the structural silicon, but what about the spacer bar? Yeah? Because we're doing a bit of um, quite a tough thing to the spacer bar. Usually the spacer bar is aluminum or stainless steel. Now all of the shear deflections, yeah? What's the spacer bar doing? Currently nobody is bothering. Maybe the spacer bar industry doesn't have a big, um, big standing. It's um, the silicon guys seem to have. But where the kind of spacer bar suppliers saying, oh wow, I'm a bit concerned, what are you doing with my spacer bar? And also there was quite some research being done and um, of course the kind of traditional spacer bars, the kind of um, lumen or stainless steel spacer bars having much more stiffness, they're not behaving as well as the kind of more modern, bit more flexible spacer bars like the silicon foam TPS and so on. Um, and this shows a kind of this slide over here. This slide nicely shows the so-called factory pre-code bending. Um, so this is a kind of approach where everything you code bend on site. With this uh, kind of detail over here, you can see that there's no shear in the structural silicon over here because this is a factory pre-code bend, at least for the structural silicon between the glass and the aluminum framing. And then, as I mentioned actually before, the next step would be that we factory pre coat band also the glass, which means then on this one we then would have the same. It's not, um, it's not um, sheared, but it's also this is kind of linear. So, next step, nobody did it right now, but maybe someone's going to be brave enough over the next year. Um, now, again, talking about the space bar, and this is almost my last slide, there was some research being done in the past by the University of Stuttgart. The photo shows one of the kind of silicon form space bars, and you can see how flexible they are. It's just amazing. You can do almost anything with it. So in terms of cold bending, um, this is a big plus, yes, because with a kind of traditional space bar, you have the butyl over here. Then there's some suppliers oh, who started designing kind of um, enhanced traditional space bar with the two bigger pockets of butyl. So we get a bit, bit more butyl over here, so the butyl is better to actually take the shear stresses and better to elongate. And then, of course, silicon foam and the thermoplastic TPS space bar. So now the last slide shows a comparison done by the University of Stuttgart quite a few years ago, um, showing the kind of shear stresses comparing two different types of spacer bar. So kind of traditional rigid spacer bar made of aluminum or stainless steel. And I think this was the TPS here, spacer bar showing how severely we can reduce the shear stresses in the spacer bar if we bend the glass, either cold bend or even wind load deflections. And this brings me to my last slide. So we have a bit of time left for question and answers. Uh, how, uh, sorry, how did you deal with the spring back effect? Um, I did some testing on other projects years ago and um, we did cold bending and we took the cold bending force away. Yeah? And we expected that the whole unit comes back to full extent, but it's not. There is a spring back, yes, and we figured it's about two thirds. So um, because we had um, IGU with a laminated inner pane, and you can see that um, both the PVB interlayer and also the silicon seems to creep, so to a certain extent, when you code band and take the force away. It's not coming back to full extent or takes quite a long time until it's coming elastically back. Um, so it is a spring back effect, yes it is. But also this kind of effect also reduces the long-term tensor stresses on the structural silicon because um, the PVB slightly creeps and so on. So it's, um, there is a spring back effect, yes. Thanks. <laughs> Since there's uh, relaxation in the PVB as well as the silicone, um, have you encountered any um, issues or difficulty getting warranty on the PVB uh, for long-term loading and tension? It is a very good question because in the end, whatever we do, we need to get warranty from the glass supplies, from the glass processors. Now, some glass processors um, have no clue. Um, they just want to sell their glass. If especially go sometimes like to Far East Asia, some suppliers just want to sell their product, and yes, yes, do whatever you want with the glass. We don't really. Um, some other glass presser said it needs to be perfectly flat. I mean, you need to get the glass presser um, in your boat quite early. You need to speak to some people and know when you go out for tender. There are actually glass processors being willing to give you a 10, 12 year warranty for your glazing, especially for the durability um, of the edge seal. 
Um, yes, it's, you have to check it before, otherwise you go out for tender and nobody wants to bid on your job. Um, and you need to also convince the glass processors on what you're doing, um, it's going to work out. Um, yes, it is, um, de definitely yes, but you should have warranty. If you don't have um, warranty on your product, then you failed. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Uh, really interesting. I found all three, but yours. Um, the Shining Towers, you mentioned that you did some uh, testing for uh, weather testing, presumably cyclic, static water. Did you do seismic testing on those? Uh, was there included, any effect yeah. uh, that you can share with us? I mean, we do the so-called um, horizontal racking test, um, so the kind of mock-up and the kind of um, Jack is pushing the kind of bottom support actually sideways, which is a very typical standard test. Um, and also this was actually successful. When you do the cold banding, and one of the tricky issues is when you install the cold band units on site, because you cold band, and um, to get the male-female um, units actually um, locking up, so locking into, this is a bit of a tricky exercise, because it's no longer flat, it's actually curved. Um, but the seismic, um, it was not an issue, so the test actually passed. Yeah, what, what we found in seismic testing is obviously there's racking and rotation, but a lot of the systems actually work very well because of the sliding along the stack joint. Uh, for a cold bent solution, I would have thought there would be more restraint on sliding. Um, it's just to a certain extent, um, for example, when you install the unitized panels and you want to shift them slightly to the left-hand side, for example, because the kind of joint is misaligned, then it is more tricky pushing the panels sideways because of the curvature, they're more or less bit of locked into the next panel. Um, so it is a bit more tricky, yes, um, but it's not a deal breaker, I would say, so you can handle it. That's, um, Another question there. So just to sort of speed it up, come ahead. Um, when you pre-band uh, those units, um, isn't that slowing down the construction process? I mean, the th three point, uh, you can take any model, p push it at, at some place, uh, pre-band it, but, uh, and bend it for the place uh, it's, it's it is now. If you pre-band, yeah. then you put, uh, you pre-band, uh, you have a module that belongs to in a certain spot, so which makes it difficult in logistics in the construction phase. Have you experienced any slowdown here? Correct, yes. I mean, um, for the Credit Libre Knee project that I worked on a couple of years ago, um, there was a barcode on each unitized panel. And um, so we factory pre-code band, and then we're pre-code bending frames, so we're kind of frames. We then put the pre-code band unitized panel into a kind of transportation frame, where the pre-code bending was then kept by some wedges. Um, it's more logistical effort, yes because every panel then has to go into the right spot um, on site. Uh, usually, I mean, we put on barcodes with a barcode scanner. There was a kind of elevation drawing, so even s relatively simple numbering system. So there was a kind of um, elevation map, and you hold it up, you know, this panel goes exactly at this spot. Um, the issue with the factory pre-code bending, when you take the unit test panel out of the pre-code bending frame, then it goes back slightly. So during the final stage of installation, yes, it goes back, then back in. So it's, um, but logistically, yes, it is more effort. Yeah. Hi there, did you like what you just saw? If you did, why not like the video? Drop us a comment below as well as share the video with others since GPD is all about sharing. And to receive more videos in future, subscribe and don't forget to click the bell icon for notifications. Ciao!